anybody get any Valentine's chocolates? <laughs> so if I seem especially happy, it's because I've eaten my share this morning. I accidentally left some in my office, which I enjoy. I have a little cold, so hopefully that won't uh, come between us and the message this morning. I thought I had disguised it well by taking a fair amount of drugs this morning. But it turns out every time I open my mouth, someone says, do you have a cold? <laughs> like, can you tell? God's still good, and I'm glad to be here. Good morning. So, maybe some of you have a favorite Bible verse that comes to mind when you think about what's on your wall, or for some, maybe what's the perfect tattoo. I discovered this one this week, and I thought... Well, I didn't discover it this week. It's actually been my Bible verse for a long time, or one of my favorites. I have it on a little cross on my wall in my office. And uh, it's one of those perfect ones, I think, and I still think. But it turns out I didn't have a clue what it meant. I thought I did, and it sounds good. You know, and you, you ever see someone who has a tattoo and they think that it means one, one thing and you realize it means something else? One of my favorite examples of this is a friend who had... Um, he <laughs> had Jesus plastered across his back. But the tattoo artist and him did not know how to spell Jesus. I'm like, that is so bad. J-E-S-E-S. -E -S. That's not how it's spelled. Um, this one would make a better tattoo than that. It's the joy of the Lord is my strength. It makes a good tattoo, and it makes a good wall. And please don't get on me if you have a theology against tattoos. That's not where I'm going with this. <laughs> where I'm going with sometimes scripture is so much richer and better than we can ever dream of. Amen. You know, it's so much more. I thought the verse meant, okay, we get joy from God. It's so much better than that. Or we get strength from God. It's so much better than that. And in fact, the entire book of Nehemiah is so much better than what I thought it was. I'm really enjoying going through this series with you. I hope that you have invested a little time to read the book of Nehemiah for yourself. Because today I was going to go through chapter 8, 9, and 10 of Nehemiah. And I'll tell you right now, I'm going through that one verse. <laughs> so the rest is on you. Uh, we might catch up to chapter 9 next week. But uh, really, if you really, really want to know God's word, you need to read it. I can only give you so much, but, but I'm excited about today's uh, so much. So we'll, we'll go right there. So we're in the book of Nehemiah to catch you up. Uh, Nehemiah occurs all, all around 500 B.C. Uh, we learned about some of the facts leading up to this. The Israelites have been carried off into exile. They're in Babylon. They get to come back. And in 445, they uproot them who are there, who have been there in Jerusalem. Uh, that's what they're coming, or where they're coming back to. They get busy under the direction of Nehemiah, and they rebuild the wall that had been destroyed about 150 years prior in the war that had taken them off to captivity. So 445 BC, the wall finally or miraculously, after 52 days of its reconstruction, is in place. And then, Nehemiah gathers the people for an assembly. The wall's up. We're protected. We can now worship. The temple had been built prior to that. So now, they can have a little reprieve from their enemies. The walls are up. The gates are in place. And what is the first thing that they do? They put the platform, probably from the scaffolding, in the center of the city. And Ezra, who is most probably the main author of the book of Nehemiah, he's a scribe and also a priest, Ezra climbs up that big wooden platform with the big old Bible on a scroll. And he reads by the Bible, I mean, the Bible they had at that time was the first five books. And he uh, reads from that before the people. Well, they're all standing around listening. Literally, it says they are standing for six hours, listening to Ezra read the scriptures. Now, keep in mind, they had left God. They had been disobedient. That's why God allowed them to be carried off for the promised number of years, 70 years. And that's why God had... 
figured out a way to bring them back to Jerusalem after those 70 years. They still have a choice to make. Are they going to follow God and be his people? Or are they going to just tune them out like they've been tuning them out for basically over a generation? Nehemiah 8.9 reads like this. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites. This was the group of people who had been put over the care of the church and the spiritual needs of the people. And the Levites, who were interpreting for the people, said to them, Don't mourn or weep on such a day as this. So they're hearing the scripture. They're coming to an understanding of it. It's being explained to them. And they're mourning and weeping. Don't mourn or weep on such a day as this. For today is a sacred day before <coughs> the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. See, as they wept, Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites are going around from group to group. Wait, wait, wait. Stop crying. It's okay. Stop. They're interrupting this outpouring <coughs> of emotion and grief. Verse 10, Nehemiah continued. Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before the Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. And the Levites, too, quieted the people, telling them, hush, shh, shh, shh. Don't weep. Shh. For this is a sacred day. So the people went away to eat and drink at the best of meal, to share gifts of food, and to celebrate with great joy because they had heard <coughs> God's word and understood them. Praise God. Amen. See, when we leave here, we got this part right. We go eat, don't we? <laughs> because we have heard God's word. It's time to celebrate. So let me just slow down a little bit, because I have to tell you, the first time I heard this, I'm thinking, I think they probably should weep. They're guilty as all get out. They should mourn all the sins. They should mourn the fact that they had turned their face on God. They should mourn that a little bit. That's called guilt, good guilt. See, guilt can be good. That recognition that we've done something wrong and stepped away from God ought to wake us up a little bit Amen. and bring something to our spirit that says, you really blew it. They're listening to all of God's promises. They're listening to Deuteronomy over and over and over again. God warned them and warned them and warned them. If you turn away from me, there's going to be curses. They would have recognized had they obeyed God, there were blessings. Blessings or curses. They chose curses and they got them. So I said, why are they saying, hey, stop crying, let's go party? I think maybe God had something to do with that. Hearing also might have brought a little bit of fear and trembling. Hearing how far they had failed. What if God wouldn't forgive them? But see, I think God's grace had already gone before them. Amen. God was already working in their spirits when they get to this point, in those 52 days even, as they're building the wall, coming together as a city again and as a nation, bonding together over the sweat and the grit of building. God was in those moments as they prayed for one another. And as God encouraged them, and as Nehemiah encouraged them, and as they encouraged their brother and sister. Remember this, they were building the wall. They have a hand on the sword and the other on the uh, tool or whatever they were doing. Rocks and building, leveling. God was in those moments reminding them, I'm with you. In 52 days, bam, the walls are up. And the conviction sets in. And when they hear all that God had done for them and all that they had done wrong, they were moved. We too need to remember and reflect upon those things that we have done wrong from time to time. We need to make sure that we have sought God's forgiveness for each and everything we have done wrong. The first
first step to that is recognizing that we are a sinful people. We were born with that ought to sin, the want to go against God's way, to do things our way. That is our human nature. We want to do things our way, not God's way, until God steps in and intervenes for us. Scripture tells us all, like sheep, have gone astray. It means we want to go our way and turn from God's way, and then we want to justify it to God why we did it. You know, we're masters of justification. But Scripture is very, very clear. This is sin. It is sin to go our own way. That is a sin. We need to turn and look to God for the direction he would have us to go. We need to read the word. We need to understand the uh, commandments. And if you can't remember all of the word and all of the commandments, let me just narrow it down for you. You love God and you love others. That's a life without sin. If you're completely loving and worshiping God and you're in a right relationship with God, you don't want to turn from him. If you truly love others, you're not going to murder them or have adultery or bring harm to them in any way. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to take God's name in vain. You're going to obey God's word. Amen. Love God. Love others. So, why the celebration in the midst of them finally feeling the guilt they should have felt many years prior? Excuse me. I think the celebration is, oh, I don't know, twofold, threefold, fourfold. <laughs> First, they're told to, to celebrate. So let's call it obedience. Okay, we can't cry anymore. We got to go have a party. <laughs> but also, the walls are done. That's cause for celebration. When we accomplish something so wonderful in the Lord, <coughs> because of the Lord, it's cause for celebration. There's other days when we can weep and mourn. The wall is up. I think the big thing, well, there's two big things. One of the big things is that they are finally back into the fold. They're, they're in the center of the walls with the word of God, hearing from God what he would have them hear, that they've gone astray. And God's saying, okay, you get it. I hear you, and I forgive you. Welcome back into a right relationship with me. You're my nation. You're my people, and I'm your God. Amen. They're right there in the center of God's word, hearing God. The, re the covenant, the ongoing, everlasting covenant is renewed. Things are looking pretty good. It's a new beginning, and that comes to the next reason for the celebration. It's a sacred day. What day is it, you might be wondering. It is Rosh Hashanah. That name came later, but that was, or is, the Jewish New Year. It's the day of new beginnings. The very beginning of the year that means head of the year. The first day. The newest day. The bright day of renewal and new beginnings. Do you think it was a coincidence? <laughs> it's like I'm picturing God looking at his calendar. It's like, okay, 48 days, 49 days. Come on, you got two more days and you can make it. We can have this party planned for New Year's Day. It was perfect. They finished exactly when they needed to finish in order to celebrate New Year's Day, new beginning for them. It's great, perfect timing. Now, in March, we're going to be learning our next ser uh, sermon series is the Jewish Feasts and Festivals. So we're going to come back to New Year's Day. But right now, I want to tell you that New Year's Day for the Jewish people is celebrated with trumpets. It's like God said or recognized, we're going to have a party and we need some serious noisemakers. Bring in the trumpeters. I mean, truth is, throughout scripture, uh, 72 times in the Old Testament, we, we hear the trumpets or we see them referred to in scripture. They're referred to as a way of alarming the people. War is at hand. Something's happening. It was a way of communicating from one person to the next what's happening with the war. They used the trumpets. They didn't have cell phones, so that was the next best thing. It also, in addition to war and alarming the people, it um, commemorated the coming of a king. Seven, six times in the Old Testament, we see that it's heralding in the king. 
and in particularly the king through the lineage of King David. The seventh time will come in Revelation when the trumpet sounds and the king of kings will be announced when he comes back to earth. And six times in the Old Testament we see that the trumpets are sounding for a time of joy. It's a time of celebration. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? And guess when the seventh time will come? It will come on Rosh Hashanah, the time or the festival of the trumpets, when the trumpet is sounded, when Jesus comes back. And if you can just picture these Israelites in the center of Jerusalem with the walls all around them and the safety and care of God, do you not think that might be? It was history, but also a picture of the day to come when all of God's church is gathered together when Christ comes back to a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, and a new earth. It's just a perfect picture for us. Amen. God shows us over and over as we dig into the word what he would have us to know. He wants us to know that he is going to protect us and gather us in and that we will be with him forever if we could only put our faith in Jesus Christ and follow and obey him. God is there for us. Amen. Now during the same uh, month, uh, we'll call it the month of the fall, uh, October, November, there's also the Festival of Atonement and the Festival of Booths or Tabernacles. And we're going to come to those too. And if I had more time, I would convince you maybe that they're all related to this as well. We just don't have time to go through all of it. God's word is consistent, and there's not these accidents in there. It's not a coincidence, and it's God is over everything. Amen. Well, back to our Israelites. It's like, no, this is not the time to weep. This is the time to celebrate. We're back together. It's the family reunion. It's time to celebrate your rebirth and your renewal. Let's, let's get this party rolling. See, even when one sinner comes back to God, Scripture tells us the angels are having a party. There's a party in heaven. And when we consider the joy of the Lord, do you know what gives God joy? See, God's very essence is love and peace and joy. That's part of who God is, the character and essence of God. But we learn in Scripture God can receive more joy. God is full of joy and receives joy as we repent and obey and come back to God. This is a God party that's going on on Rosh Hashanah. It's God celebrating what is happening in his people. <coughs> we'll back to the little verse. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I want to emphasize kind of what the word joy means here. And so I do have to get academic on you. And if you'd like, on the back of your notes, excuse me, I have the Jewish word, um, or I'm sorry, Hebrew word. Keep in mind, the Old Testament was first written in the Hebrew. And to understand these words better in the original language, it requires a little digging. Uh, there's several forms of the word and the roots to the word, but I'm just going to give you the short version. The word is kedva. And if we were to combine the different places where we could find information on Kedva, this is what it means. Joy. <laughs> it means joy. That's the easy one. It also means to make glad, to rejoice, gladness. It also means to be joined, as in to be joined together, or unity. It can also take on the word bride, or show a picture of a bride, or a bride in that union between a bride and groom. So we can understand that joy is not just happiness, it's much more than that. In fact, this joy builds <coughs> unity with God. It's bigger than ourselves, and it's pretty much irrelevant to the circumstances because it's not about what's happening here on earth, it is a, a joy that comes from God. It's not your joy gives you strength. 
No, it's the joy of the Lord. So it's God's joy, which is outside of our personal circumstances. In fact, that's good news. Because we're so imperfect, and so is the earth on which we live. It's no longer a perfect joy as we experience it. It's a joy from God that we can experience as we determine to step into that presence of God. It requires a bit of an effort, sort of like worship, where we have to tune into God. It doesn't just fall on us. We just walk around and then bam, you've got the joy of the Lord. It means coming into that presence of, of Jesus or with God and recognizing the true nature of God and taking that in for ourselves. And that's possible on a spiritual realm that is very difficult, I think, to completely understand in our humanness. But as we do that, we are blessed with the experience of that gladness and joy that comes from God. It takes turning away from our sin, turning away from our own way of doing things and coming into that right relationship with God. And we know the only way that can happen is by putting faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, allowing Jesus' blood to cover our sins so that we can be in a right relationship with a holy God. Amen. That's step one. We have to have that right relationship with God by God's grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. As we do, we can take on the joy that is of the Lord. Writer and pastor Tony Renke explains, God's joy is part of God's very essence. God's spirit manifests the supernatural joy in God's children. Joy is the deep down sense of well-being that abides in the heart of the person who knows all is well between himself and the Lord. See that part again. Joy is the deep down sense of well-being that abides in the heart of the person who knows all is well between himself and the Lord. I think you can see the reverse of that. If there's sin in your life, you know things are not right between you and our holy God. It's that discourse, that feeling, that angst, that if you're really truthful with yourself, you know you, don't, you are not experiencing the joy or the love or the peace that comes from the Father. Let's go a little deeper. Your joy rests on God's joy and on knowing who God is. Better than that, maybe, our church's strength comes from the joy of the Lord. Amen. The joy of the Lord is the church's strength. It's our whole community's strength. It's the Israelites' strength. Biblical joy is inseparable from our relationship with God. And it springs from our communion with God through Jesus. And if you didn't catch it, just hang with me. I'm going to say it three more ways. <laughs> As God is present in our life, the joy God experiences can be experienced <coughs> by us. Yeah. It's written in scripture. Mm -hmm. Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the, and the pleasures of living with you forever. God wants you to experience pleasure and God's joy. Yeah. Author Martin Lloyd-Jones defines joy a little bit differently. As a quality which belongs to the Christian, Christian life in its essence. And it conforms to what we see in our Lord. The world has never seen anyone who knew joy as Jesus knew it. And yet, <coughs> he was a man of sorrow and appointed with grief. So our definition of joy must somehow correspond to that. Joy is something very deep and profound, he writes. Something that affects the whole and entire personality. In other words, it comes to this. There is only one thing that can give true joy, and that is contemplation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joy is the response and the reaction of the soul to a knowledge of, 
a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Now that you got that down, let's move to strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I got joy. No, I hope that's not on the movie or on the film. <laughs> Everyone on Facebook just went, oh. <laughs> I can't show you my guns. I don't got any. Um, but I got some strength. That's the point I want to make. It's not about muscular strength. You know that, right? Amen. It's about our spiritual strength and our sense of well-being. Strength, in the same verse, comes from the Hebrew word ma'oz. And what it means, if we were to just study it a little bit deeper and pull apart that word, is that it's a fortified place. It's figuratively a defense or a fortress, a rock. It means to strengthen. It means a strong or stronghold. Think of army and safety. It's a place of means of safety. It's a place with protection and refuge. It's a hedge, or a hedge around. Also, if we continue to go, it can be depicted as a garden. In fact, if you take apart each of the letters of the word from strength, we see that there are four things that surface. A fenced-in area, which is separated and secured. There is also a letter there that represents a gate, and one for revelation. So we get garden, fence, oh, I forgot garden as well. Garden, fenced in area, separated and secure, with a gate and with revelation. So we can put those together, and we see this, this picture, a beautiful fenced in garden with gates. I think could be a picture that takes us back to the garden. That perfect place of perfect safety in the presence of God before sin that we will be restored to someday Amen. when we leave this earth. I think it also depicts the gate there. There's a choice. We may choose to come in or not. That God allows us by our free will to participate in God's presence, but we don't have to. If we want to go our own way, God allows that too. I think this idea of revelation is when we're in God's presence, we have a revelation of who God is. Perhaps the gate acknowledges that too, that it allows God to come in and out of God's presence or God's revelation. And just for fun, it could point to the book of Revelation, right? I don't know these answers. <laughs> it's just the language is so rich. It's God reminding us there's more. Or only dig. What is God trying to show us? Do you think the Israelites got it? They're standing within the walled, secured place of God that has been provided for them, the promised land, so that they could have a right relationship with God and be his nation, his lighthouse to the whole world. Do you think they got that? The strength that they receive, the protection that they receive, the unity that they receive, it's not about the walls. It's about who God is Amen. and who God is in their life. That's true joy. That's true security that goes beyond just the walls that they had put up. If you want to experience God's refuge and safety and draw upon the joy gladness that God has as you come into a right relationship, unity with God. Guilt and despair do not promote growth or transformation or thanksgiving and praise. When you have said, I am sorry to God, God forgives you. Your sins are removed as far as the east from the west. He's like, no, don't go there anymore. I need you mobilized. We got things to do. Amen. Praise God. Have a party and let's get busy. You and I are in a family together. All of us. We have things to do with a right attitude that brings us pleasure and blessings that only those who know Christ can experience. That's our gift from God. Amen. When we come into a right relationship from God, you know we get the fruit of the Spirit. We have to nurture that fruit. But we receive things like 
joy. <laughs> it's one of the fruits of the Spirit when we come into that relationship. And God is pouring his gifts on us. Further, as we live out a life of faith and obedience, joy is reflected in our lives. It's part of our witness, or at least it ought to be. It's part of that what the world sees, and they hopefully want a little bit of that. Psalm 31, 10 and 11 tell us, Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad. Be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all of you whose hearts are pure. God tells us over and over, sinners were once lost, when they are found, it's time to celebrate. And they come back to the Lord, and when God's people come back to God, it is time to celebrate. I'm running out of time. Let me just give you one more verse from Psalm 81. It says this. Sing for joy to God our strength. And there the psalmist pairs together strength and joy. Shout joyfully to God of Jacob. Raise a song. Strike the trim timbrel, the sweet-sounding lyre with a harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon. The feast of the trumpets, by the way, is at the new moon. This is a reference to Rosh Hashanah, to a new beginning with God. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. God wants to have a new beginning with you. God wants you to be drawing close and obedient hearts, celebrating who God is. Lastly, I'll point out in your notes, I'm not going to go through them. For those of you who enjoy your Sunday afternoon homework, there's some references there of how to grow joy in your life, how to focus in and receive the joy that God has for you. You're feeling a little blue, go back to your sermon notes. <laughs> Focus on things like repentance. It will bring you joy and it brings God joy. Forgiveness. A hope of a future glory is described in God's words. Focus on prayer, coming into the presence of God. Focus on being around other believers. You know, joy is contagious. Ah, here's a good one. I like this one. You want a little more joy in your heart? Give a little of the stuff in your wallet. It'll lighten your feet. Give your tithes and offerings. Don't let them weigh you down. There's other people that can find something to do with that money to save others and to bring others to the Lord. The Christian life is and is meant to be a life of God's joy reflected through us. Amen. It is founded on our faith in Jesus, whose life on earth began as good news of great joy for all people, and whose last prayer was for his followers, us, to have his joy made full. Joy from beginning to end, and then without end. Eternal joy, perfect joy, as we meet up with God in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you for who you are, that you are a God of gladness, a God who protects us and draws us in and keeps us safe in your arms that we can experience your very essence as we put our faith in you. Thank you, Lord, for the miracles that you have done in order to draw us closer to you. Thank you for your grace, which pulls and tugs on us when we turn to go our own way. Thank you for your love that says no matter what we've done in the past, you forgive us. And you want a relationship with us. Even when we don't like ourselves, Lord, we recognize you love us completely. So much so that you sent your one and only son to die for us. So that we can be in that relationship with you forever. Lord, I 
pray if there's anybody here who doesn't have that right relationship, that today would be the day. I'm just going to ask that you continue. Keep your eyes shut. But if you want to pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you would just raise your hand, look up at me. I want to pray for you. No one looking around. Now I'm going to pray. If you follow along silently. Heavenly Father, I am sorry for the wrong I have done. I am sorry for the sins of my life. I just ask that you forgive me and come into me. And I just, I set aside my will for my life, for your will for my life, knowing that you, you've got this. And you can do so much more with me than I could ever dream of doing for myself. Lord, I want to experience your joy. I want to know your peace and your love in a new and deeper way. Help me to do that. If you prayed that prayer and you're comfortable talking to me afterwards or writing me a note on a blue card, that'd be great. I want to keep praying for you. We just praise you, Father, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a blessed week. And remember, we have membership classes at 10 o'clock. So that our teenagers, Lloyd, can sleep in. <laughs>